Hello, everyone. So um, I see that the room is packed, so I hope I did not get your expectations too high. Um, it's just a, a talk I prepared at the last minute um, because um, so there's a lot of hype about uh, linear types. Some of you may have seen uh, yesterday's talk um, at ICFP about uh, uh, putting linear types uh, into OCaml. Um, so this talk is inspired by uh, reading that paper and uh, the, more importantly, the papers uh, that uh, it referenced. Uh, so as a heads up, uh, my talk is not about yesterday's talk. Uh, just, a, just so that it is clear, it's, it's about uh, uh, other works uh, that, uh, that uh, came before it. Um, so, so I am, uh, at the start, I'm more of a proof theorist uh, working in linear logic. And um, so more recently, I uh, studied uh, notions of ownership in programming languages. Um, so I wanted to share my reaction to reading uh, some uh, linear types paper and uh, some observations. Um, so recent linear types paper, uh, I noticed that they are differ a lot to theoretical grounding uh, by making allusions to linear logic. And at the same time, uh, uh, they made uh, claims about practicality by making allusions to the Ross programming language. So uh, what I want to share in uh, my talk is uh, my view about articulations between theory and practice. Um, so I have the impression that there is uh, some uh, gap between uh, the modern view on linear logic and linear types. And uh, a last question is, um, so many of us want to see an analogy between Rust and linear types, and uh, is this analogy justified? Uh, is there any connection with linear logic? So for people who are not familiar with uh, linear types, linear types made a lot of promises. Uh, you'll be able to do functional programming without a GC. Uh, you'll be able to manage resources uh, safely. You will be able to do functional programming um, with in-place updates, so not doing any allocations. Um, you will be able to program uh, for parallelism without data races. And all of that, uh, seen a bit more abstractly, um, is the promise that uh, linear types is the key to encapsulate, um, encapsulating state, non-local state, uh, shared state, and so on. So it's a promise to reconcile imperative and functional programming. So that's uh, quite a huge uh, promise. And uh, it also sounds a lot like uh, Rust, uh, indeed, in terms of promises. So when JR uh, wrote the linear logic paper, uh, immediately a uh, lot of people saw the importance of that for programming, uh, starting with um, Yves Lafon, uh, for instance, who explained how to uh, how a linear uh, logic-based uh, programming language would uh, eliminate the need for uh, garbage, garbage collection. And uh, the history of that is that um, people realize that it's too limited in expressiveness. And uh, from the 90s, people were looking for ways of increasing this expressiveness. And this history goes um, not just uh, through functional programming, but the idea was taken also in systems programming and object-oriented programming, so there are lots of work beyond uh, what you find uh, about uh, linear types. So uh, ownership types, uh, uniqueness types, and, uh, and many things. And uh, so where are we at? Uh, no. 
so on the other hand, on the theoretical side, linear logic uh, is a logic. Um, so what's interesting is that uh, it prevents you from forgetting a hypothesis or duplicating it. So the analogy that interested people is uh, to link that with the use of uh, values. And um, it also has, uh, and that's the important part, um, modalities that allow you to recover um, more traditional features, like uh, being able to uh, dupli duplicate uh, either the values or the continuation and so on. Um, things did not stop with the initial um, release of uh, Gerard's paper. Uh, there are a lot of work also in theory to understand what linear logic is. And uh, it was well the work of uh, 20 years to rephrase linear logic in a modern way. So the first paper, uh, linear logic. Uh, I also put here uh, the um, uh, later paper, uh, which is more uh, textbook uh, style about uh, the modern view. And uh, they are, uh, the contents, you can look at them, they are very different. And uh, it took uh, quite a while to go from one to the other. And uh, so to get more into the details, what happened is that there has been a shift in the point of view. Uh, instead of uh, seeing linear logic as a logic with modalities, we saw it as um, a logic uh, that say how to relate worlds of different colors. So instead of having one color and a modality that encodes uh, well, what's missing, you have bridges between a world, uh, say restricted, non-restricted. And uh, what matters is how these worlds interact. So that's the modern view, uh, shifting from a modality to uh, multicolored logic. So in more uh, technical terms, um, I go from a common ad to an adjunction and, uh, and uh, with a specific properties. And uh, what's interesting is what are those uh, properties? Um, so uh, one uh, point I, I want to try to make in this talk is that the map is not the territory. So the rules of logic, the rules of linear logic, that's not the same as linear logic. Uh, so not only there can be different presentations, but it's not just because you uh, read the rules of linear logic that you understand what's going on in the mathematics. Uh, so linear logic was uh, invented with certain models in mind. And among the, uh, uh, the, the successes of linear logic, uh, that it's, there's a certain view about uh, strictness and uh, the uh, links between Kolbe value, Kolbe name, and so on. So when we speak of linearity, uh, whether I use something once or more or not, um, it's useful to uh, think differently about the linearity of values and linearity of computations. Um, so the notion of linearity of computation, uh, if you unfold what uh, that means in linear logic, say if uh, consuming a pair once is the same as con consuming each component once and so on, actually you see that you are reinventing strictness and strict data types. And uh, if you end up in a logic where you can talk about uh, linear values, then uh, you are already strict in some sense. So strictness is a con condition of possibility of linearity of values. Um, so I, I thought about this shift in perspective, and uh, it makes us see the logic very differently from what it was in the start. Um, at the start you had modalities and um, um, 
And uh, at the end, uh, you focus on what is the modal character of each type uh, in link with uh, the, the modalities. For instance, uh, if you have a pair, is it copyable? Well, linear logic says that uh, a pair of uh, two things that are copyable is copyable. And um, so the thing with uh, polarities, which embodies this uh, change of perspective, is to bake this uh, structure into the um, into the system that I'm uh, that I'm studying, and then um, the modern view also tells you that uh, what matters are the different ways of converting between polarities, um, and uh, the important example are the functions. Is a function copyable? It depends whether the variables it closes over uh, are uh, copyable. And uh, so that gives you, uh, uh, from the start, the fact that there are several types of closures, depending on whether uh, it closes over linear things or not. And so we can compare uh, what was the first um, uh, view of linear logic, where you had an intuitionistic arrow, a linear arrow, um, that gets merged into a single arrow whose intuitionistic or linear character in the early sense depends on the copyable character or not of its argument. So we get rid of this dis distinction when uh, we use uh, polarities. And instead, we see up here um, another distinction, a distinction between linear and copyable functions actually linear and copyable closures. Um, so I like to see linear logic as the uh, sidekick of the theory of effects. So there are lots of interactions between the theory of effects and, the, and linear logic. Um, so this ex explanation of strictness um, and all that actually can be related to uh, considerations in the theory of effects, uh, monads and so on. Um, so, uh, personally, when I talk about linear logic, I don't make the difference with, uh, the, I don't put it aside from the rest of the theory of X. So to me, it's supposed to be, a, a, I hope that at some point there will be a coherent whole that uh, let us speak about uh, both uh, linearity and effects. And um, in this area of uh, effects, uh, there has been a success in uh, talking about the theory of computations, uh, uh, continuations, linear, uh, nonlinear, and so on. And um, uh, it helped making the link between uh, with a sequence calculus and focusing. Uh, so I think there was a, a talk about sequence calculus, and it's it's interesting to see that the history of uh, of those uh, systems actually come directly from linear logic. Um, okay, so if you want to uh, make the connection tighter, you, tighter, you have to talk about Colbert Pujoli and, and so on. And um, so I want to talk about, about different uh, case studies. Um, one uh, work that I like uh, a lot is the work of um, Jesse Toff and Ricardo Puccella about uh, affine practical types. And uh, they observed that um, systems that uh, take insp inspiration from linear logic are either foundational calculi close to linear logic or special purpose type system. And their uh, ambition is to have a system that is both uh, practically minded and close to linear logic. Um, so that was an experiment in uh, language design. And uh, we uh, find that uh, they make the same shift in perspective. Um, so they bring practical arguments for this uh, shift in perspective. Um, so this distinction has a long history, so they did not invent it, but uh, they made uh, uh, good contributions about it. Um, for instance, the contribution of saying, how do you type a composition operator 
a single composition operator for the whole multicolored logic. I think it's an interesting contribution also for, um, uh, from a purely, purely theoretical perspective. That's a very natural uh, question that we may have. Um, they also emphasize the role of abstract data types, linear abstract data types, to, uh, to general new interesting uh, linear uh, behaviors. And uh, it has been criticized, be criticized because it's, um, <coughs> it has some limited expressiveness. Uh, that's a valid criticism. So uh, to express certain patterns, you're uh, forced to uh, do some threading of capabilities by hand. Uh, so it's less expressive than certain uh, uh, ownership or capability-based systems. And I could say because it's complex to implement, but there have been works to uh, simplify the implementation of uh, that kind of system. And uh, it's, also, it's also sometimes, uh, and that's the part that interests me here, is that it's dismissed as too complicated as a type system. And um, the getting from uh, Grandpa linear logic to this view of linear logic, of linear types, uh, is, has been qualified as a swamp, uh, but uh, my view is that uh, it's, it's interesting to see that a practical experiment matches the modern view on linear logic, and that gets me back to my remark about uh, the difference between the map and the, and the territory uh, that I made earlier, that is not because you implement the rules of linear logic, uh, that uh, you implement it, its interesting features, uh, are you not just forcing the users to do the job of the compiler, uh, for instance? And uh, the, the last thing uh, that I find uh, a good argument for it is that although it has a, a bit um, uh, of a computationally um, simple interpretation of uh, what polarities mean, uh, it can be generalized to more interesting models of computation. And uh, some aspects uh, remind us of Rust, indeed. Um, so, first, the general organization around copyable and affine uh, kinds, uh, which remind of the distinction between uh, the drop and the copy traits in Rust, for instance. Uh, it's interesting to see that Rust came with that, not by reading uh, in our types paper, but uh, it came straight from uh, C++ and uh, move semantics that were developed uh, in the early 2000s. And uh, the peculiarity of having several types of closure is very natural in, uh, in Rust. And uh, the analogy uh, can be explained by a uh, link between polarities and uh, uh, type classes for implementing uh, sub substructural types. Um, another uh, example I wanted to study is um, uh, what happens when um, you want to mix linearity and control. So uh, it's a non-issue. Well, if you do a control effect, like raising an exception or returning, then you are silently discarding variables in the scope. So that seems to go against uh, linearity. And uh, so uh, in ALMS, they were upfront about it. We cannot solve it, so we are going to go with affine types instead. Uh, that's not entirely satisfactory because we, we want to also to control where things are dropped when we want to manage resources, for instance. So it's a well-known issue also in uh, theory because uh, you can state it as the fact that the linear error monad does not have a strength. Um, so I found that other works uh, simply remain silent about the issue, and I, I'm not sure what is the message, like, do we want to get rid of exception? Uh, maybe we want some very explicit language uh, in C style. And uh, so I wanted to propose a thought experiment. What happens in, in, in practice if you don't have exception, then uh, you have to use the error type. So um, when you take something, you have to replace it with something else. 
And uh, so what happened? Then you're having an error monad that is not strong, that I cannot use at every place where you want to drop a variable. Then you want uh, to be explicit about what happened, and it becomes very verbose. And so the practical experiment are about, about that, uh, you can uh, read papers about Cyclone, and uh, they mentioned that this is too complicated, and instead they use some fallback deallocation. And what about the very, very explicit C style? Well, actually, that's the part where in C, uh, people use go-tos. So uh, you need to have go-tos in your lang language now. Um, we can push the thought experiment further and wondering um, if the C++ Rust notion of destructor could have been re rediscovered with linear types. The idea is that um, to make the error type a monad, I want to have a canonical way to drop each element. And this canonical way is called uh, destructor. Um, so that's the starting point. But then what happens? Then you're starting to talk about an algebra for this notion of uh, destructor. When you uh, make a pair of two things that are destructible, then you want to say that the, there is a canonical destructor that's going to uh, drop one, then the other. Actually, um, so, uh, if you do that, you start getting at where C++ and Rust is now, and the notion of destructor has been invented for that uh, in the 80s. Um, um, another thing is that uh, this is not what we see in works in, on the linear types. So, so I don't know. So um, maybe not enough programs have been written in those linear type systems. Uh, one last case study that I wanted to mention is uh, the um, hypothesis that uh, two notions are fundamentally distinct: linearity and uniqueness. And um, one says that this pointer will not be shared. And that's important if it's a resource that I'm responsible for cleaning up. And uh, uniqueness says uh, this pointer has not been shared. That means that I can reuse the memory. So is it worth it to introduce such a distinction? Um, so it is claimed as a theoretical fact. And I wanted to enter more into the details of the argument. Uh, one argument says that a system based on, uh, upon linear logic cannot guarantee uniqueness of reference. And I found that uh, this depended on the non-standard and computationally, um, uh, well, trivial to some uh, degree, interpretation of bank. That uh, this argument does not hold in uh, regular models of uh, linear logic. So it, um, I can make the point in more detail, it has to do with what happens, uh, what's the in interpretation of Bang? Um, the introduction rule is a recipe that gives you a new copy um, by making copies of uh, what's inside, uh, what's used to make this copy. Okay. And, um, There are different ways to interpret the bang. It does not mean that you are making a copy, you are creating something new. So uh, it does not um, invalidate the property that uh, every object uh, has a single reference. Uh, the second argument is that it should be possible to forget uniqueness. And um, so there's a more subtle argument here uh, that if you want to do resource management, um, actually, you need a less constrained definition of linearity. It is possible uh, to forget uniqueness uh, and linearity. 
Um, so, so I'm interested in uh, getting more into this detail, but I, I will uh, move forward. And um, I found that uh, key assumption uh, was not identifi identified, articulated, or defended, which is the idea that forgetting uniqueness has to go through a notion of subtyping. And uh, to me, that's the key of understanding why things are like they are in this type system, not what has been explained before. And uh, I want to propose an alternative hypothesis that actually to forget uniqueness, uh, you only need a homomorphism, not subtyping. So you are allowed to have a marker in the type saying that you have just shared this thing. And, uh, and uh, maybe subtyping is too strong a hypothesis, and is it worth it? And uh, in this way, I hope we can leave the room for uh, other necessary features of such type system such as uh, the notion of uh, mutable balls that also embody uniqueness, but in a different way. Um, so to conclude, uh, we've seen a lot of convergence between theory and practice. And I find that there is a coming of age of both linearity and ownership, and uh, we can be very excited about it. And uh, I found that weaker works as weaker in both theory and practice at the same time. And uh, one uh, thing I observed with uh, certain uh, works on linear types is that the main result of these works uh, is usually the proof of some internal property of a, of a type system. Uh, but to, I'm going to paraphrase Gerard, a bad idea does not improve through formalization, it becomes a formal bad idea. And to paraphrase Sabine Osenfelder, it's not because you do something that is refutable that it is science. And another point I've been trying to make is that the map is not the territory. Um, there's a difference between linear logic and the rules of linear logic. Thank you. Hi, um, <clears throat> so you mentioned that um, you don't want forgetting linearity to happen implicitly, like in the subtyping process, and, Sorry. yeah. Sorry. Oh, um, I, I think you were saying that you, you don't want linearity to be able to be forgotten implicitly using something like subtyping, and you proposed that forgetting linearity should be um, um, how we do uh, mutable borrows. So can you elaborate a little bit on, on this? Um, so uh, I made a, a point that is a bit different. Uh, so we want to leave space for mutable balls. So there are lots of features. The, the type system is going to be very complicated. So I'm not sure I want this, this distinction between linearity and uniqueness. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to find it uh, in a different way. So I want to be able to share something that is linear to the whole world. I want to do mutations. And then when, once I'm done with mutations, ah. mm -hmm. I uh, distributed to the world in a copyable fashion. So that's like freezing, right? But freezing. mutable borrow assumes that you can get back the immutability Mut afterwards. Mutable borrows is something else. Here mm -hmm. the analogy would be with borrowing. Mm -hmm. So if I borrow the thing, um, that's something you, you actually can do in a Rust. I can freeze something by, uh, so it's called uh, leaking the contents of a box. That returns you uh, actually the yep. a pointer to the contents. Mm -hmm. And uh, the observation here is that if you want to make that work uh, in a functional programming setting, you need additional rules that are those of a homomorphism. So not the full subtyping, but simply rules that say, when you uh, freeze a pair, it's as if you uh, froze each component of the pair, and so on. OK. OK. Mm. Thanks. So I wasn't entirely clear on exactly what your opinions were about all of these case studies. Can you, know, is, is that not on? Yeah. Sorry. I wasn't completely clear on, on your opinions.
opinions about coming out of all of these these case studies. Uh, you're maybe not as provocative as I was hoping you would be. <laughs> um, concretely, in particular, do you think that the design presented yesterday for OCaml is is the wrong way to go? Is there is there some alternative design you have in mind, or? Yes, so I'm going to repeat something I said at the beginning. This talk was not about yesterday's talk. Okay. Um, so I have uh, more elaborate thoughts about uh, what has been proposed for OCaml. Uh, but so I made some point about the distinction between linearity and uniqueness, and I hope that there is some um, design space that can be explored. And will that apply to OCaml? Do you think? Will what apply to OCaml? This design, uh, the the results of this investigation. Are you expecting them to apply oh directly yes, I'm to OCaml? I'm hoping that uh, it can apply to OCaml. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.